Hey, uh, good morning. How are we doing? Good, good. Hey, Matthew chapter 5 this morning is where we're going to be. So put one finger in Matthew chapter 5, the other finger in Numbers chapter 12. So Matthew 5 and then Numbers 12. So let me just give you kind of the, the scope of where we are uh, just as a church. So um, a few weeks ago, we extended the call to Alan Pittman to come and be the pastor. Uh, I've been serving as interim here since October. And uh, Alan is going to start uh, the 15th of July. The 15th of July-ish. No, no, the 22nd of July. I apologize, the 22nd of July. And then, so this is actually, I'm going to be gone the next two weeks. And so this is kind of my official uh, last day as interim. I'll still speak the 22nd and the 29th, but as a guest speaker uh, while Alan's here. And so as I was preparing uh, kind of our talk or our, our moment this morning, uh, I just realized that, that this is a great verse to end on, a, a great verse to kind of pro project us into the next phase as a church. Uh, the next two weeks, we'll continue in the Beatitudes, and Lyle Wells will be here uh, but, but I think this is appropriate that, that God brought us to Matthew chapter 5, verse 5, uh, uh, to kind of launch us into the next stage. And so we've been looking at the Beatitudes for the last several weeks, and, and we know that the word blessed means happy. And, and it's not a, a, a happiness that's dependent upon anything else. It's a transcendent happiness that, that kind of leads to uh, this contentment that's not dependent upon anything else. And, and it's hard for us to even imagine what that looks like because so often our happiness is dependent upon something else. Like so often our happiness is dependent upon uh, what our spouse thinks of us or, or how our kids are behaving or, or how our financial situation is. But when Jesus stands up and speaks in front of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and this whole kind of Jewish group, he says that, hey, this happiness is transcendent above all of your outward circumstances. And so we've looked at blessed are the poor in spirit, happy are the poor in spirit, happy are those who mourn. And this is the last one that we'll look at that, that's in that same vein of kind of your ethereal in nature or thoughtfulness because then what the next Beatitudes do after this one actually goes to the application of these three Beatitudes. So Matthew chapter 5 verse 5 says this, Blessed, happy are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now that word meek is, is often misunderstood in our culture and, and inside of our context. Uh, that, that word meek means gentle, mild, soft. And, and inside kind of the Greek culture at this moment, uh, that word meek was often used uh, when cults or other animals were broken so that they could be useful for work. Now, uh, I've mentioned multiple times that I'm a city boy with a capital C, right? Like so I'm a city boy, grew up in Dallas. Uh, didn't spend much time on the farm, have tons of friends here who grew up on lots of land, knows what it's like to work with animals, but I had a unique experience when I was in college uh, because I was an ag development and leadership major at a and And so that was part like leadership degree, part uh, go work with your hands in the land sort of degree. And so there was one particular class that I took and it was dairy science. And if you believe it or not, dairy science uh, is a big class here at A&M. And actually on the A&M campus, there is an actual working dairy. At least it was there when I was in school. And so I, part of this class is I had to go to one hour a week, go to the lab, which was the actual dairy that was on campus at A&M. And so uh, I didn't grow up doing 4-H. I didn't grow up doing any of that stuff. Uh, but this particular lab had an assignment that you had to do, and I had to halter break a heifer. Now, for some of you, let, let, me know, let me let you know what a heifer is. A heifer is a cow who's never had a baby, okay? I didn't know what that was until that moment, but a heifer is a cow who's never had a baby, and you had to train the heifer so that when they did have a baby and you could milk the cow, then they would have, be trained to follow 
the course, so to, so to speak. And so here I am, uh, 21 years old, and I have to halt or break this heifer. Now here's how we decided to choose the heifer. They put a bunch of cows in the middle of a ring, in the middle of a room, and you had to go and catch your cow. That's what you had to do. Now, I had lots of experience catching things because I played football, but catching a cow is a much different level of things. And so here I am, and I'm competitive. I'm like, I'm going to be the best cow catcher there is. And so I'm getting in here, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to figure this thing out. And I get, and I, I see, I zone in on this cow, and I'm like, that's her. That's my girl. And so I go in, and I go, and I grab this cow about the fourth time, the fourth try. I grab her on the neck and drag her out. They put a halter on her, and I start walking this cow, or better yet, the cow starts walking me. And so we go, and she's walking me, and I keep yanking on her back, yanking on her back. Well, my grade in a college class depended on how well I halter broke Betsy. That was her name, Betsy, because that's what every cow needs to be named is Betsy. And so every week I would go out there multiple times, catch Betsy, put a halter on her, and then walk her all around, walk her all around until she would actually walk with me. So uh, the, the funny part of that story is that they didn't tell us, but at the end of the semester, we had to show our cow. And so literally, I was in 4-H. I mean, it was crazy. And so I'm showing the cow, like the week before, I'm, I'm shearing her, and I'm giving her a bath, and all this stuff. I've got her standing right with the back leg in the right spot. I know all the facts about Betsy. I know, I know her mom. I know her dad. I know her birthday, all these things. And I'm dragging her around this ring, and sure enough, because I'm competitive, I won my heat for showing Betsy off for how well she was halter broke. Like by the end, I could walk her around and I could stop and I could kind of hit her leg and she would get in the right spot. And then we'd walk around again, hit her leg, get in the right spot. The, the funniest part was at the end, since I won the heat, they took a picture of me and they put it online. And, uh, and so that summer, after that class, uh, I started dating Lindsay and that's when Google first came out. That's when Google came out. Believe it or not, kids, there was a time before Google. I know it's weird. Hard to believe. And so they took a picture of me and Betsy, this proud little cow that I have. And Lindsay, right when we start dating, or about a month after we start dating, she Googles my name. That was real popular to do, was Google your name. And this first hit was this picture of me and Betsy. And Lindsay was like, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> you told me you were a city boy. So, so what I found really interesting, though, is that when I would take Betsy and I, after I halter broke her, I could go in and I could walk wherever I wanted to and she would follow me. She, she would just go wherever I led her. But, but here's the question. Who is in charge of that relationship, really? Betsy was. Betsy was. Because Betsy had the power. Betsy had all the strength. Betsy had everything that she needed to take control of that situation, but she would come up to me and she would allow me to lead her to wherever I wanted her to go. And so that word meek is actually perfectly illustrated by that, that when I put that halter on and led her, Betsy would go willingly wherever I, would take, wherever I wanted to take her because she knew that I had her best interest in mind. She knew that I was going to do what was best for her. Even when it was painful, she would follow me wherever I led her because she knew that I trust, that she had a trust between me and her. And so that word meek is a giving up of control to someone else or to something else. Now here's what it says. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth, for they shall be inherit the earth. So it's this interesting phrase that is here, like those that allow themselves to be led by someone else, to take their personal positions, their personal opinions, and to be led by someone else will inherit the earth. Now, 
sometimes we get meek confused a little bit. Uh, sometimes meek has meant that people are weak or people are lazy, but that's not what it means at all. It means power under control. Uh, sometimes people think meek is a certain personality type. Like they think type A's can't be meek, but type A's can actually be very meek, just like a sanguine can be meek. Meek doesn't mean you're wishy-washy. Meek doesn't mean that you're not sure of yourself. Meek simply means, hey, because of the trust that I have between someone else, I'm allowing that person to lead and to take me where they want me to go. Now, there's an illustration here in Numbers chapter 12 that I find pretty interesting. It's about Moses, and Moses is beginning to get some opposition, and listen to Numbers chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says this, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman whom he had married. For he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed speaking only, spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very meek. More than all people who were on the face of the earth. How about that description? Now Moses was very meek, meeker than any other person on the face of the earth. Verse 4, and suddenly the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron and Miriam, come out you three to the tent of meeting. And the three of them came out. Now, put yourself in this situation right here. Moses leads the people out of Egypt into the wilderness. They start to wander around. And Moses begins to be criticized by the people that he, has, that he is leading. And so we have here Miriam and Aaron. Aaron, one of the other leaders in the group, are now speaking out against Moses because of his wife, the Cushite woman. Now, if you put yourself in Moses' situation, I don't know what you would be like, man, but when someone else starts speaking bad against my wife, I begin to get a little hostile at times. You know? I mean, my wife went to UT. You want to say anything bad about that? I'll come after you. I will. It's just true. Like, when we were dating together, like, they were like, George, how can you date someone from UT? I don't know. She's beautiful. I just get it. She loves the Lord, and she's great looking. And so, man, we just tracking well together. And so, I'm just doing it. Like, that's who I'm going to date. Don't judge her by going to UT. I know that's a real judgment, though. But don't judge her on UT. So, I can ID with Moses a little bit here. And listen to what he says. Verse 5. And the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam. And they both came forward. And he said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream, not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak mouth to mouth clearly and not in riddles and he beholds the form of the Lord why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses and the anger of the Lord was kindled against them and he departed now verse 10 and when the cloud removed from over the tent behold Miriam was leprous like snow and Aaron turned toward Miriam and behold she was leprous. Now, the three of them are outside of the tent of meeting. They're having a conversation with God, and God looks at Aaron and Miriam, and he says to them, hey, a prophet has come, and I speak to him face to face, and so why do you feel the freedom to speak against him and to raise up a revolt against him? He is my man. And God, the pillar of cloud, the pillar or the cloud moves away. And Aaron looks at Miriam, and she's leprous. Now, 
I don't know what Moses is like in that situation. But imagine that someone has spoken against you, and then you have a conversation with God, the three of you, and you look over, and they have leprosy. You're like, that's right, sucker. Don't mess with me again. You want leprosy? You got it. Don't speak with me. Why, better yet, why don't you tell everyone else that you know that if, you speak, if they speak against me, I am going to come after you with the power of leprosy, my friend. Don't mess with me at all. I mean, I don't know if Moses is like that or not. Well, we know he's not, but... That's, in, in a way, like, my flesh is going to be like that. Am I the only one here? Hey, like, I'm singing the vindicated song, like, don't mess with me. Everything is okay. I got God on my side. And look at what happens here. And Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, do not punish us because we have done foolishly and have sinned. Let her not be as one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes out of his mother's womb. So Aaron comes and begs Moses, hey, go talk to God. Go talk to God. Verse 13, and Moses cried out to the Lord, oh God, please heal her, please. But the Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, should she not be shamed even seven days? Let her be shut outside the camp seven days, and after that she may brought, be brought back in again. So Miriam was shut outside the camp seven days, and the people did not set out on the march till Miriam was brought in again. After that, the people set out to Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Fascinating here. Moses, wronged by two people, spoken against amongst the group, where people were beginning to rise up and revolt because of his wife, the person he personally chose to live life with. Then they have a meeting with God. Miriam struck down with leprosy. Aaron comes to Moses and says, listen, do what you can. Go talk to God. Let him heal her. So Moses sets aside his personal issues and goes and speaks to God, implores God, and then God tells them the process that Miriam is supposed to go through to be restored. And Moses follows the process, but then listen, he delays the group from leaving, and then Miriam comes back into the crowd. He comes back, and then the group leaves again. You see, meekness is setting aside your personal ambition, is setting aside your hurts, setting aside your wrongs, setting aside your opinions, and choosing to follow what God says and let his hopes, his vision, his dreams rule the day in your life. That's meekness. And that's what Moses does right here in Numbers chapter 12, who is considered the meekest of them all. Now, we live in a society, in a culture that is driven by accomplishment. Like we are. Like ingrained inside of us is this idea that if we work hard enough, if we work smart enough, then we will accomplish the things that only we can do. And it starts at a very young age. Like, ever see a child learn how to walk? Man, they are driven to learn how to walk. And those first steps, like, they're beautiful and they're celebrated and it's all these great things. But that keeps going. That ambition is rewarded by cheers. And it keeps going. Like, now my kids are obsessed with getting better at Fortnite. They are. Like, they are obsessed with, they're watching YouTube videos. How do I get better at Fortnite? They know where to hike. They know where, what guns to get. They know all the things that they need to do to get better at Fortnite, and they're driven by it. And then it doesn't stop there. When we get in college, we're driven by getting a job or a career or advancement, thinking that, hey, our ambition leads the day. Our ambition and our drive leads us to where we want to go. But meekness 
is coming to the Lord and saying, God, I am living my life open-handed. You've given me free will. You've given me control. And I'm relinquishing that control over to you. And so God, you tell me where to go and I'll go. You tell me what major to have, and I'll do that major. You tell me how to raise my kids, I'll raise my kids that way. You tell me whom to marry, and I'll do that. You tell me what job to take, and I'll just relinquish that control to you. And you'll all go wherever, whenever. And I love the promise here in Matthew 5.5, 5 because it says that when you do that, your giving up of control actually leads to your inheritance of the earth. And that's not a prosperity gospel sort of thing. That's a, hey, you will now have this ability to speak into other people and to model for other people what it means to walk with the Lord and to follow hard after Him. Now, what does that have to do with us right now? I mean, like I said that at the very beginning, that I felt like this is a very key scripture for us as a church right now. We're in this little bit of a transition time. I mean, I know you've felt it. We've all felt it uh, since Butch uh, resigned and then this interim time and then now Alan coming. And as I was thinking about kind of where we are, like, there's been some things that we're just used to. Like, we're used to our church. We're used to the, the way we operate. We're used to the personality we have. We're used to the vision. We're used to all these things. And now we're welcoming in a new leader. We're, we're welcoming in a new family who is now going to come and we, in a way, are relinquishing control of the church and we're saying, hey, Alan, as you hear from the Lord, you lead us. As you hear and as you study the community, as you come and get to know us, as you come and see what we've been about, you come in, you hear from the Lord, and then you lead us to where you want us to go, where you feel like the Lord is calling us to go. And so now as a church, we have to be at a spot where we're going to be willing to allow Alan to lead. And that's not an easy thing. Like during transitions, what happens often is different people have this different set of power and different set of control. And then a new leader comes in and when that new leader comes, he starts taking back some of that power and control and it feels weird. It feels uncomfortable at times. But we have to put ourselves in a place where we are willing to follow the man that we have called here by God to take us to the next spot. To take us to where God wants living hope to go. And we can't enter into that stage or enter into that moment with this sense of accomplishment from the past you can't you can't bring the baggage from the past good or bad into the next situation you have to walk in and you have to say hey Alan we want to we love you we want to know you we want to walk with you and we want to trust that you're hearing from the Lord and we will follow wherever you're willing to take us And so the question is that we have to leave with today is twofold. The first is in life, are you submitted to the Lord in a way where his dreams, his values, his purpose, his hope for your life rules your thoughts? Because that's what meekness is, where you relinquish control to him. But second, but second... Corporately, are we at a spot where meekness comes in and we're willing to welcome in a new pastor and say to him, 
there were a group of seven of us that trusted, that fasted, that prayed, and asked for the man that God would have us to lead us into the next phase. And we think that you're that man. And so we trust you. We'll follow you. You hear from the Lord, and we'll go. I think the biggest danger that a church could have in the middle of the transition is to have a group of people begin to rise up and say that they know better. And so they have a better vision than the man that God has called to lead. And so the question is, are we meek individually? And are we meek corporately as a group? Now, what I've learned over, over my 37, almost 38 years, and then about 17 or 18 in, in ministry, is that, is that a good sermon doesn't bring any kind of change to it. Like, like words on a page or words spoken out to a group of people on its best day will last to about Wednesday. Like it'll last about three days. But yet, when the Holy Spirit of God comes in and begins to speak and convict and challenge, that changes the course of a person's life. And so there's no words that I can say right now that would say, hey, you be meek. Hey, like, be meek today. Oh, that's not very meek. Be meeker. Like, that, there's, there's no words that I can say that will bring about that kind of change in us. But what I do know is that when God comes in through the Holy Spirit and we ask him to do that, then through his power, our ambitions decrease. And his ambitions increase in our life. And so I want to end maybe a little differently today. And I know who we are. I know that we're Baptists. And I know that at times it's hard to end things a little differently. But if we could maybe just, just take a deep breath and then just say, hey, I'm going to trust George here. So, so I would like to end not by having a song that we sing in response, but rather have a time where our church would pray together and ask the Lord to develop that kind of meekness in our heart and meekness in our soul. And that God would begin to prepare us to welcome in someone who's going to live life with us and lead us to the next place. And that we would trust him now, even though we don't even know him. That we would trust him. That we would love his family. And that we would begin to relinquish the things that we need to relinquish here at the church. Things that, that you think you know the best about. The things that that you've been running for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And you begin to relinquish that and say, God, I'll follow the vision that you've given to the man we've called here, or you've called here. That doesn't come from a sermon. That comes from God transforming your heart and my heart and our heart. And so I wonder, can we do that? Like, can we end a little differently today? Is that cool? Like, this is yes, this is no, and you can be honest with me, yes or no. Okay, I see more yeses than nos, and so, so here's how I would like to end. Uh, Eric and the group are going to come, and they're just going to play instrumentally for us, and, and I know this is going to be uncomfortable, okay? I know it, but let's, let's press into it. Get in groups of four to five. And it's not legalistic. It can be six or seven or three. <laughs> but get into small groups and begin to pray out loud. Like someone in the group say, hey, I'll start and, I, hey, and I'll finish. 
and begin to pray out loud for the next phase of living hope. For the next 20 years, by the grace of God. That God would use this church to usher in a movement of the gospel. That God would be more known because of what this church does, because of Alan's leadership here. And that the things that that you feel like you need to give up, that God would allow you to give those things up so that this city or this church would inherit the city around us and would have influence in it. And God would do a work that only he can do. But in order for God to do a work that only he can do, people have to trust to do, trust God to lead him in the right way. So, so let's stand. Let's get in groups of three to seven and, and begin to pray out loud that God would do a unique work here in this church, in this city, through the next pastor.